In the tumultuous landscape of the 1920s, amidst rising global tensions and economic uncertainties, the establishment of Pan American Airways marked the start of an unexpected transformative chapter in aviation history. Established on March 14, 1927, by a trio of enterprising United States Army officers, Pan American Airways emerged as a beacon of American innovation and strategic foresight. Fueled by the imperative to secure pivotal mail-carrying contracts, Pan American Airways swiftly transcended its modest origins, laying the groundwork for what would come to be known as the Jet Age. Welcome back to Compelling History. Today we embark on the first of our four-episode series on the airline, which changed flight, starting with an exploration of Pan American Airways' remarkable early journey, tracing its trajectory from humble beginnings to an icon of American prowess in the skies. Join us on this captivating voyage through the stratosphere as we illuminate the enduring legacy of Pan American Airways and the indelible imprint it left on the global stage of aviation. Make sure you're subscribed so you know when the second part of our series is released. And don't forget to hit the like button on this video to help support the channel. Part 1. Founding an Empire On March 14, 1927, three United States Army officers joined together to found Pan American Airways, fearing the growing influence a German-owned Colombian air carrier, SCADA, was having in Central America. SCADA had been operating in the region since 1920 and was lobbying hard for landing rights in the Panama Canal Zone, ostensibly to survey air routes for a connection to the United States. This was seen by the U.S. Army Air Corps as a precursor to potential German aerial threats to the American-owned canal. America! Since its completion in 1914, the Panama Canal was a crucial link for shipping between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, reducing travel time between them by weeks and contributing to greater economic prosperity for America. As fears of SCADA's influence in the region were growing, the U.S. Post Office would request bids in the spring of 1927 on a contract to carry mail between southern Florida and Havana, Cuba. Upon learning of this contract, two of Pan American Airways founders, Henry Arnold and Carl Spatz, drew up a bid for the opportunity, hoping to establish their business. However, by June of the same year, they would have competition from Juan Tripp, who formed a company with financial backing from numerous people, including Cornelius Vanderbilt to help back his venture. While Pan American Airways would go on to win the contract, they would be left unable to meet the requirements due to their lack of planes and facilities. Based on our research, we determined airplanes are essential for an airline, but feel free to correct us in the comments below. Anyway, the post office would give a deadline of October 19th for Pan American to meet their requirements. Three days before they were going to lose out on the contract, they would come to an arrangement with the other companies who were bidding on the contract to form a partnership, merging into one company several months later. The partnership would charter a Fairchild FC-2 float plane from a small Dominican Republic carrier to operate the flights to Havana. Much like ocean liners, these flights would also eventually have a passenger service to maximize profits. Once the airline got off the ground, they would build up an extensive network of routes from their hub in Miami. Destinations like Puerto Rico, Port of Spain, Rio de Janeiro, Buenos Aires, Santiago, and Bogota, to name just a few. In the early days, Pan American's aircraft were made up of sea planes, which would go on to have lasting effects on the airline industry. Pan American pilots wore naval-style uniforms and adopted a set procedure when boarding the aircraft since the planes they were operating took off and landed on the water. Pan American would also develop procedures for flight planning and air traffic control, which can still be seen in airlines across the world today. As the airline grew, the federal government of the United States wanted to spread out the airline industry between the few largest airlines. Resulting from this, Pan American made a deal with the government to be the primary American carrier flying international routes in return for not being able to operate domestic routes, which would be operated by the remaining large airlines. This gave Pan American the ability to focus on expanding their international routes both in and outside of South America, while also being able to call itself the American Overseas Carrier. Because of this, Pan American would become a symbol of America around the world, even after it lost the government's support of this monopoly. 
Despite this significant advantage in the industry, Pan American would also become known for its marketing campaigns long before the iconic image of the airline during the jet age. An example of this successful marketing was a campaign they co-sponsored with Bacardi, which successfully encouraged Americans living under prohibition laws to escape to Cuba for short periods to drink rum in the sun. During its early days, one of Pan American's pilots and surveyors was Charles Lindbergh, the first man to fly across the Atlantic solo. By 1939, Pan American would expand beyond the Americas with its first transatlantic flight made possible by the recent delivery of six large Boeing 314 flying boats. Four years later, Pan American Airways would begin calling itself Pan American World Airways before officially changing its name to reflect its focus on world travel in January 1950. Part 2. Expansion Around the World The story of Pan Am's early expansion would not be complete without mentioning the airline's key figureheads, Juan Tripp. Tripp and his associates worked tirelessly to broker deals, which gave them the ability to expand outside of the Caribbean to Central and South America. During the late 1920s and early 30s, Pan Am would buy up ailing and defunct airlines to grow their fleets and obtain crucial routes. In April 1929, Tripp and his partners forged a pact with the United Aircraft and Transport Corporation UATC, to allocate Pan Am's activities exclusively to the southern side of the Mexico-United States border. In return, UATC secured a substantial ownership interest. UATC, the predecessor of today's Boeing, Pratt & Whitney, and United Airlines was the parent entity. Also in 1929, Pan Am would purchase a controlling stake in Mexicana de Aviación and took over the route between Brownsville, Texas, and Mexico City. They would also negotiate with the U.S. Postal Service to win most of the postal routes for the region. In September 1929, Tripp would tour with the previously mentioned Charles Lindbergh to negotiate landing rights in a number of countries, including Colombia, Venezuela, and along the west coast of Peru by the end of 1929. During this year, the stock of Pan Am's holding company was one of the most sought-after stocks on the New York Stock Exchange, sparking speculation on the stock during new route acquisitions. To operate these Central and South American routes, Pan Am also utilized a fleet of Sikorsky S-38 flying boats, later adding 28 of the larger S-40 in 1931, in addition to the previously mentioned Boeing 314 flying boats. These S-40s carried iconic names like American Clipper, Southern Clipper, and Caribbean Clipper. The use of Clipper harkens back to the 19th century fast sailing clippers. Pan American Airways operated their extensive fleet of flying boats out of their self-named airport in Miami, Florida. Originally a Navy air station opening in 1918 but always serving flying boats exclusively, the International Pan American Airport was purchased in 1928 and had an Art Deco design with a large globe in the lobby which became an icon of the company. As Pan American began dominating the Latin and Central American routes, they began setting their sights on other international routes around the world. By 1935, the airline won the contract for a San Francisco to Canton mail route, which had originally only carried mails and cargo. In 1937, they would expand their service to European cities using S-42s via Bermuda and the Azores. Around this time, they also began serving flights across the North Atlantic to Ireland via Newfoundland and New Brunswick to determine routes to the United Kingdom and Greater Europe. This was made a reality in 1939 when Pan American received their order of six long-range Boeing 314 flying boats with the company's first commercial transatlantic on March 30, 1939. Departing from Baltimore on a 17 and a half hour journey to Horta, Azores, before continuing on to Lisbon, which took a further seven hours. These Boeing 314s allowed for regular transatlantic service, which later expanded to American cities like New York and other European countries like France and the United Kingdom. However, their United Kingdom routes would also take advantage of those serving flights in 1937 when the Northern Transatlantic route from New Brunswick, Newfoundland, and Ireland to Southampton in June of 1939. Before the outbreak of World War II engulfed the world and their business, Pan American had expanded to China, flying to Singapore for the first time in 1941. This began a regular semi-monthly service between San Francisco and Singapore, a journey which reduced the travel time from 25 days to just six days. 
Also, before the outbreak of World War II in America, Pan America began using the first pressurized airliners, which allowed their aircraft, the Boeing 307, to fly higher and out of turbulent air, increasing the appeal and passengers' ease of mind. The success of these was short-lived, however, since these aircraft were commandeered for military service when the United States entered the war. Over the course of the war, Pan American would fly over 140 million kilometers worldwide in support of U.S. military operations. Even and carrying President Franklin D. Roosevelt, making him the first president to use a plane when traveling abroad. Part 3. A Roaring Success Following the war, Pan American would continue to use the political influence built up during the 20s and 30s in its lobbying efforts to remain America's primary international airliner. This would prove to be less powerful than during the pre-war years, with more and more competition springing up on all its core international routes, such as TWA and American Export Airlines targeting the U.S. to Europe routes, while airlines such as United and Northwest focusing on the West Coast and Pacific regions. A notable blow to Pan American status as the primary international airliner came in October of 1945, when American Overseas Airlines became the first airline to begin regular land plane flights connecting the United States and Europe. Realizing they would not be able to maintain their lucrative status forever, Pan American would begin finding ways to set themselves apart and grow the business. In 1947, Pan American would begin offering a service it has since become iconic for providing. June of that year marked the start of the airline's scheduled round-the-world flight. A DC-4 would depart from San Francisco for Calcutta on Thursday, stopping in Hawaii, the Philippines, and Thailand before arriving in Calcutta the following Tuesday. There they would meet a constellation with another group of passengers on the Around the World flights, which had left New York and stopped in Canada, Ireland, the United Kingdom, Turkey, and Pakistan, with another group of passengers on the Around the World flights. The passengers would then switch planes, and they would return to the United States retracing the route the other group did, only in reverse, obviously. This would continue pretty much unchanged until the company's first Boeing 707s took over in 1960. Seeing American Overseas Airlines' as success, Pan American would acquire the airline in early September 1950 for $17.45 million. Later in that month, the company would order 45 DC-6Bs, the first of which was the Clipper Liberty Bell, the Clipper used in the inaugural all-tourist class rainbow service between the United States and Europe. Did you know Pan Am offered a direct flight from the U.S. Pacific Coast to London and Paris, by sometimes making fuel stops in Greenland of all places? To attract passengers for these and other newly possible routes, Pan American would take further inspiration from the shipping industry with the wide usage of promotional posters, which became iconic for their bright and colorful tropical scenery depicting destinations passengers could escape to and the same model plane which would be taking them. These posters would be displayed in department and specialty store displays or along the walls of travel agencies, the preferred method of booking travel during the 1950s. These posters, while iconic, were only a small part of Pan Am's overall marketing strategy. Airlines during the 1950s mainly focused their marketing budgets on newspaper and magazine advertisements, where they'd reach the widest audience. However, Pan American's posters were not meant to reach the widest possible audience. They were meant to make the airline stand out amongst the growing competition on international routes, since the company lost its almost monopoly following the Second World War. Towards the end of the 1950s, Pan American was operating regular flights to every continent except Antarctica, naming itself the world's most experienced airline. In 1958, this tagline was only strengthened when passengers would fly on their pressurized aircraft such as Boeing 314, high above turbulent weather, and served by multilingual flight crew who served luxurious meals with champagne and caviar. To many, this was thought to be the final form of passenger flight, but would be proven wrong in late October of 1958, when the Boeing 707 jetliner was introduced with Pan Am as the first customer. Conclusion The legacy of Pan American Airways stands as a testament to the power of ingenuity, perseverance, and visionary leadership. 
From its humble beginnings in the 1920s to its heyday in the 1960s, Pan Am not only reshaped the skies, but also captured the imagination of generations worldwide. Thank you so much for watching the first episode of Compelling Histories series on Pan Am. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to like and subscribe to help the channel grow. Episode 2 will cover the onset of the jet age, when the Boeing 707 was introduced with Pan Am as the first carrier.